everyone here this morning isn't going to be a Christian? Amen. Well, last week I, I showed a picture of us at the camp in Lithuania, and I told you a little bit about my sad story when we were uh, going over there, how I had taken things in and out of my carry-on luggage to my check luggage, and I ended up, when I got to Germany, realizing that the Jif peanut butter that I put in my thought was in my check bag was in my carry-on, and they took it away from me. And uh, how sad my life was because of that. Well, this morning in, in the foyer, someone put this bag on the table, and uh, someone told me it was for me, and I opened it up, and there I am. <laughs> That's love. <laughs> A little too late, but <laughs> it's anonymous. Nothing to prove, nothing to lose. Sacrificial gift, somebody gave me their peanut butter because some German guy in his family is more than my <laughs> You know, we often find, find ways to express and understand more deeply, you know, God's love for us. And there's some beautiful pictures in Scripture about God's love. Uh, he created man to have fellowship with Him. A man deliberately stepped over the line. And before... And as God was punishing that sin, God took an animal He created and He made garments of clothes for them. And it shows us an expression of His love. Sin snowballed and got so bad that God was even grieved He created man. He had to send a flood. Noah and his family, eight and all, were saved through that flood. And after that flood occurred and the ark rested, God made a covenant. Not necessarily because He needed it, but because we needed it. And it was a covenant to say, I'm not going to punish you this way again. And He's fulfilled that promise. Every time we see a rainbow, we're reminded of that covenant. And that covenant partially was there so man would know that God's perfect gift to an imperfect people is a fresh start. And he didn't want man's relationship with him to be based on fear of another flood. He wanted it to be based on love, of the promise of something better, the fact that his perfect gift to an imperfect people is a fresh start. Sometimes that's a powerful message of love. Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son who goes and you know just lives his life the way he wants to, and it breaks the father's heart. And that story is about him realizing what he's done and wanting to go home. And the father runs out. We see God run. Puts his arms around him. Shoes on his feet. Cloak on his back. Ring on his finger. They kill a fatted calf. And it's a description, a picture of God's love for us. It's very powerful. The cross is that ultimate expression of as enemies of God, He sent His Son to die for us. He so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And Jesus' love, His sacrificial love for us is demonstrated in that cross. And it's a very powerful picture. But before that, in John 13, it says He takes a bowl and a towel. He washes the disciples' feet. And at the very first verse, it says... He shows them the full extent of His love. Wait, he's fixing to go to the cross. He's fixing to sacrifice His body for us. But in this context, it says He shows them the full extent of His love. What was that? He served them. He sought their highest good. He looked out for what was best for them. You know, sometimes I often try to use illustrations to, to paint pictures of the powerful message of God's love. And... Now that we're, we're putting these on YouTube, I get to repeat for free some illustrations I've used in the past without you telling me I repeated the illustration. And there's one I'm fixing to use. Kevin forgot the details, so I'm going to have to use it again. And uh, but you can't guess what that one is. Um, but there's one story that's told about a son who was estranged from his family, had been off at war. This is way back probably in, in World War uh, around World War I. He had come home. He had been away from home for years. And he had been estranged from his family. He never got along with his father. 
And he knew that he might not even be welcome at home, so he wrote a letter and said, I'm going to be traveling through on a train, and I want to come home and see you, but I'm not sure you want to see me. If you want to see me, I want you to put a bow on the tree, a white bow, and if it's there, I'll stop. If it's not, I'll continue to go on. So as the train got close to the city, there was a blizzard that just was a white blanket. You couldn't see hardly anything. And so he sat there in the window, his breath fogging up the window, beginning to look to see if, if there would be anything for him to stop for. And as he got closer, there seemed to be a relief in the snow drifts. And he looked at the tree, and there, covered with ribbons, not just one, but hundreds of white ribbons, was the message I want you to come home. That's a powerful message, isn't it? There's a, a father in Italy who had been estranged from his son and wanted to reconcile before uh, his life on this earth was gone. And he sit, put a, a message in the paper and it said, Paco, I forgive you. I love you. Please come to the town square. And he gave the date. And on that day, he stood on the town square. Hundreds of Pacos showed up. It's a powerful story, isn't it? Because all of us understand what brokenheartedness is. We understand when we're estranged and we need that message to come home. And the one that Kevin forgot about, you know, that I've said once or twice here. Uh, a story, actually a true story. It's an interesting name. The boy's name was Durkee. He grew up in New Mexico. His father was a very wealthy man and owned a lot of property. And they made a movie about this particular story, uh, believe it or not. But the boy was always wanting to, to go on adventures. And so he kept bugging his dad, let me go with the pilot, let me go with the pilot, I want to fly in the plane. And finally his dad kind of got wore out and said, okay. And he went up in the plane with the pilot, and when they got over the mountains in New Mexico, they were surveying some land, and the plane's engine died, the plane went down, it crashed on the side of the mountain, the plane was destroyed, the pilot was dead, and this little seven-year-old boy was in the mountains alone. The father was pretty enterprising, he called the print shop, he went and got a package, he went to the airport, went up in the plane, and on white glossy paper in big black bold letters, the message, Dirty, I'm looking for you, I love you, I will find you, your father. That's the message of the cross, isn't it? I love you, I'm looking for you, I'll find you, your father. Powerful pictures of God's love for us. I remember seeing a, a situation one day in a uh, parking lot. Uh, it was one of those grocery stores in a small town. There was one of those horses that you ride as you come out. You used to put a dime in or whatever. And so a, a lady and her child came out and the little boy wanted to, you could tell he wanted to ride on this horse, but she said there was no time and she was in a hurry. And pulls the child so hard that it hits the pavement. And his knee is skinned, his mouth is bloody, and I, you hear the words, we don't have time for that. We're in a hurry. And I think to myself, I'm so glad God is not in a hurry. He loves us. There's lots of ways you can describe it, but one very powerful passage of Scripture is the one that was read just a few minutes ago about God's love. God is love. You often see people on television do this now. The message of the Bible is God is love, and there's some, there's some things that the passage that was read and the verses above it tell us about that love I want us to reflect on this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to uh, 1 John chapter 4, and Billy read verses 16 and following. So I want us just to read, starting in verse 7, down to verse 16. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God does not know 
uh, does not know God because God is love. This is how His love, He showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that, he might, that we might live for Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son as Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God lives in Him and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. First of all, he says, we need to acknowledge God's love. He acknowledges God's love. He says, this is how we know what love is. God sent His Son to make an atoning sacrifice for our sins. John Richardson wrote a book several years ago called Peace Child. He was a missionary in a very uh, distant place with a very distant tribe. And they lived a very different life. And as he began to try to preach the gospel then, he would tell the story of Jesus and his disciples. And he would get to the, that Passion Week and he would begin to talk about what Jesus did for them. And when he got to the part of Judas, they would begin to cheer. Because in their culture, to be a person who is cunning and crafty and deceitful and betrayed other people, that was a good thing. And so they thought Judas was the hero and that Jesus was weak. And he was so frustrated because he didn't know, how am I going to get these people to understand what Jesus did for them? Because every time I try to communicate, they take things the wrong way. He was frustrated. And then one particular day, he woke up and there was all this commotion in the tribe. Women were chasing their husbands. Husbands were grabbing their, their sons. And the chief of the tribe grabbed his son and headed down to the river. And on one side of the river, there was the enemy tribe who they'd been warring for years and years, lined up on the other side of the river. And then this tribe lines up on the side of the river. The missionary's heart was pounding in his chest. He didn't understand what was going on. And then the scenes began to unfold. The chief took his son across the river and gave it to the enemy chief. They took the baby and they passed it down the line. And each of these warriors with bones through their noses and through their ears, with tattoos on their body, war paint, just fixed up as fierce warriors were taking their hands and rubbing it across the belly. The missionary's thinking, what in the world is going on? What's going to happen? And someone began to explain to him that this chief son is the peace child, that this son is given to the other tribe, and as long as this son is alive, there will be no war. There will always be peace. And then the missionary the light bulb went off. And now we can tell the story of Jesus because Jesus was God's peace child. It says this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us peace. God wants us to acknowledge that to other people. He wants it to, us to acknowledge it to ourselves. And I don't know this year for some strange reason. I mean, I've been a Christian for a long time. I grew up in the church. I know God loves me. I know God delights in me. I know all that stuff. I went to school, learned Greek and Hebrew. I know all that. But for some strange reason, lately, it's just been on my head a lot. When we did our graduation senior Sunday, and I'm thinking about what can I say to the seniors that are graduating? 
what kept coming in my head was that those simple words, God loves you. And when I went to Lithuania, I thought, you know, I might do and say a lot of things while I'm there, but the most important thing is for me to communicate God's love for them. I had these nine, uh, nine, ten-year-old guys in my cabin, but every single morning and every single night, and it was interesting at times, but every single morning and every single night, I, I purposely, and I, it may sound corny, it may seem cliche, we turn on our television screens and we see signs that say John 3.16, we've almost become so comfortable with it that we Satan has got us to think and everybody knows it. And so, and every single morning, every single, I, I would say, hey, you know, rise and shine, time to get it up. God loves you. I kept saying those words. I don't know if they'll ever remember much about me. Probably, probably will. Hopefully I'll see them again. But, but you, you get the message. Senior Sunday, we got some seniors that are going on to new vistas in their life. What's important for them? That God loves them. There's an old song when I was a teenager. At night as I lay on my pillow and I look at the heavens above, I know that I'll, I'll be safe all through the night for I'm a child that is loved. God is love. God is love. God is love. I need to remember that. I also need to acknowledge that and to acknowledge what that love really means. God's love is powerful. God wants me to emulate His love. There was a woman who went to prison. I, you know, when I lived in Huntsville, I, I taught in a, as a, on, on the, the wind farm, and I worked on death row with inmates. And I remember reading a story about a woman who converted, taught a, a lot of men in prison, and she would often go in, and they would be harsh and bitter, and what she would say, the first words out of her mouth and the last words out of her mouth were always, God loves you. Regardless of what they did, regardless of what they said, and it, it, was just a, it was a powerful piece about what those words did to people. Don't let Satan get you in a mindset to think, my kids know that. Don't tell them that. God loves them. Acknowledge that. It's important for us to acknowledge it. And then... Uh, Secondly, he says, it's interesting in this passage, he says, we know and the Greek translation is the word for, for belief, faith. That word can be translated believe, it can be translated trust, it can be, be tra translated rely. A good example is in uh, Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, it says, we don't want you to be unaware of the troubles we've been through. We've, we've literally faced a sentence of death, but we've gone through all this so that we might not rely on ourselves but in God. It's the same same thing. You could say it, this happens so that we won't believe in ourselves but in God. We don't trust in ourselves but in God. We don't rely on ourselves but in God. I think it's important for us to understand that we have to rely on God's love. First John's written for what reason? He says, I'm writing these things so that you will know that you have eternal life. It's a book about confidence. I was 13. I was baptized. I was a good kid, but when it came down to being assured of my salvation, when the question was asked and it was coming around the circle, if Jesus came tonight, where would you spend eternity? My answer wasn't, I don't know. I wasn't sure. I wasn't assured. And not until I sat on the front porch of the camp and went through the book of 1 John with a Bible class teacher that I really understand that I knew that I had eternal life. Am I going to go to heaven? Yes, I am. If Jesus came this moment, where would I go? To heaven? I believe that. Why do I believe that? Because I rely on His love. 1 John is written to give us assurance and confidence. We have to rely on that love. Um, it says, and so we know and rely on love God uh, has for us. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. I have to rely on that fact. When I'm worried about my security, I need to remember that God holds His whole world in His hands and He so loved this world that He sent His Son uh, to die for me. A, a, a powerful example of this is in Romans chapter 8. Uh, it says, We are more than conquerors, starting in verse 31. Then what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all? 
And how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who uh, God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that is raised from life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That's the love God has for us. Rely on it. Know that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus did for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore? No, it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors. You know what? Billy, Scott, Kendall, Brittany, we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we rely on His love. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither, get this, death nor height, angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But the reality is the only thing that can separate us from that is us. Us choosing to walk away. And He says... Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. He wants us to acknowledge His love. He wants us to rely on His love. And He wants us to demonstrate His love. He wants people... God says, here is my child. It's show and tell. And what is what, is what He wants us to show the world? Love. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Jesus says in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you. What was the old commandment? Love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another if I, as I have loved you. How has he loved them? He washed your feet. He went to the cross. Uh, John 13 is where? He says these words right after he did what? Wash their feet. Um, and uh, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. John 13 gives us the details of what that means. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envy. And I've told you before, you can put your name in there if you want instead of love. Russell is patient. Yes. Russell is kind. Yes. Um, and you can see where your strength and weaknesses are. You can put God's name in there. But it gives us a clear picture of what love is. And what is love? The love we're talking about is not phileo love, not brotherly love, uh, not sexual love in, in the Greek. It's agape love, an unconditional love. Agape love always seeks the highest good of the other. It's a spontaneous impulse of the heart to desire that which is good for the one that we love. A love that will be at my cost. There's if love, I love you if you love me. There's because love, I love you because you love me. And there's anyway love, I love you anyway, regardless. There's no prerequisites, no conditions, no requirements. It's a gift love, a sacrificial love. It says to the other person, I will be good to you. I'll treat you with patience and kindness and courtesy and consideration and deep concern. It's a verb. It's an action. It's something we do. It's not just with word and tongue. It's action and in truth. It's a decision. Tony Ash wrote a book called Love's a Decision. It's something that we commit to uh, in our lives. So in this text, a powerful text, it's telling us three things. Acknowledge God's love. Rely on God's love and demonstrate God's love. Sometimes I think our kids, as they grow up, many things that they learn are caught and not taught. And I think they catch from us an acknowledgement of God's love. But I don't know if they fully catch from us a spirit that relies and trusts in God's love. I think that's an area we need to work on in our own lives. Because Satan wants us to rely on ourselves. God wants us to rely on His love and to truly demonstrate love. They say that when you bring children up, 
It's not so much the knowledge you have or the techniques you use, it's who you are. If you're a disciple of Jesus, that covers a multitude of mistakes. And we know Scripture says love covers a multitude of sins. And we know from Corinthians that the book was based on problems and solutions. And the problems that they had, the solution was always love. And at the end of the book, in chapter 16, verse 14, a very short verse, easy to memorize, do everything in love. A self-giving, sacrificial, Christ-like kind of love. A love that seeks the highest good of another. God is love. He wants us to love each other. Maybe you haven't embraced His love for you by being baptized into Christ, and you need to do that this morning. Whatever your need is, we ask that you come as we stand this.